All right, how's everybody doing this afternoon? I am super excited about this panel. You know, to put it simply, it is about storytelling and how we at Partners specifically bring the natural world to life for our audiences all over the world with some of the best filmmakers and storytellers in the world, like the ones sitting next to me. I'm thrilled to introduce, introduce Vanessa Berlowitz, Martha Holmes, and Chris Riley. I'm not going to read their bios because there's nothing worse than a moderator reading bios, but I am going to ask you guys each a question, and if you can give us a little bit of your background uh, as you answer my first question, that would be great. And one of my favorite questions to ask everyone who is here this week is about their passion, their passion for what they do. So I would love to understand and have you explain to us where your passion for storytelling comes from. You want to start, Vanessa? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor to be in these fantastic buildings and meet you all. Um, my passion for storytelling probably started as a kid um, with my mother, who I think probably if she'd had her time again would have been a film director. But she weaned me on to American cinema really early. So whilst my friends were watching Thomas the Tank Engine, I was being shown things like Papillon, Midnight Cowboy, Raging Bull, <laughs> Taxi Driver, um, The Godfather as I got a bit older, and then Blade Runner. And, How and old actually, were you when you were watching Raging Bull? <laughs> <laughs> too young, too young. So she was getting bootleg coffees. I don't know how she had friends in the industry, but so I, I, that's how I got my passion. It was like these were great character studies and amazing storytellers. And tell us a little bit about what you're, where you're working now, what you do now. Sure. So um, I'm very lucky. I've started a, a company with my husband and a production company in Bristol, which is the mecca of wildlife filmmaking. Uh, well, it has been for, for, for many of us. And um, we are currently producing two series for uh, National Geographic. Very honored to do so, America and Queens, and a couple of uh, feature length documentaries on wildlife for Disney. Um, prior to that, I had many long Long years working at the BBC and worked on series like Planet Earth, Frozen Planet, Planet Earth 2, and many other um, hours, single hours of, of television. We're very excited about the shows you're working on for us, so we'll get to those in a second. But Martha, I'd love to hear about your passion for storytelling. Uh, I had a very different experience <laughs> to Vanessa. So I was animals first and foremost in the outside world. So I was brought up on the shores of uh, the Middle East and Africa. So the sea was my playground, and I loved escaping the stories, as we all do, I'm sure, dramas and so forth. And I never really thought about the two marrying together. So I chased my ambition to work outside with animals, and I tried being an academic. I'm sure a lot of you are academics. And it just didn't work for me, because I wasn't clever enough. And um, I just didn't feel that my, any artistic side in me was coming out, and I hated the data crunching and I just wanted to be outside more. So then I looked into television, and then I, all I thought, I just, I'll just have a nice time being outside with animals, thank you very much. I wasn't very imaginative. And then as your life um, builds, I'm sure you have had this experience, you get layers and layers of interest as you mature and grow and find new things. And I just, so I, I went into the business just wanting to be outside filming, and then the storytelling almost eclipsed that. So now my, I, my absolute love is being in the cutting room crafting the stories when people come back from the field with the footage. So I would say it's a, it's a latter thing. I grew up on films and loved it, but I never thought my love of the wildlife would marry that, and luckily they have. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm really blessed to be in the cutting room crafting stories and trying to give the audience the best story we can possibly give them. And can you tell us a little bit about where you are today? Yeah. So I am head of natural history at a company called Plimsoll Productions. Um, it's not an entirely wildlife uh, company, we do all sorts of, we call it fact and you call it reality shows, I think, and science docs and all that sort of stuff. So we have a broad range, but a large chunk of it is natural history. And like Vanessa, I had a history 25 years in the BBC for my sins. Um, <laughs> but it's a very, very, very good learning school. And you can, you, you know, you, you start at the very bottom and you learn everything and then you can decide what, if you want to specialize, what you specialize in. So I was very lucky to have that as my hinterland. Chris? Well, I was um, about two years old when Neil and Buzz walked on the moon almost uh, 50 years ago, coming up this summer. Um, and by the time I was five, people were routinely living and working on the moon, driving electric cars deep into the mountains there. Um, three people even went there twice. It seemed like a really kind of regular thing, um, an extension of you know, our human exploration. And 
by the time I was about eight, there were robotic probes landing on Mars and Venus and sending back pictures. I had them all over my bedroom wall. And I guess it's hard to think of a bigger, more exciting story that captures you as, as a child at that age. Um, and then Star Wars came out in 1977. I was 10. And what George Lucas had managed to do in terms of visualizing exoplanets almost 20 years before they were actually discovered um, blew me away. I mean, I still get sort of shivers down my spine when I remember sitting in a dark room like this and those curtains would move slightly wider on this screen and then on would come the kind of edge of this exoplanet there. Um, and so it was really um, a passion for planetary science that I was sort of injected into there through that storytelling, I guess. And then there was a really seminal edition of National Geographic magazine. I've never told anyone this story, actually, and it's perhaps the best place to perhaps tell people for the first time. The January 1985 edition, and it's, it's on the board just outside those doors there. It's got Coco the Gorilla on the front cover. It had the most fantastic article on... Um, the planetary geologists that were exploring the solar system, the moons of Jupiter, and a little bit about what we knew about the moons of Saturn at that time. It's all over this article. And that was a seminal year for me because I was deciding what to go and study at university, and I went straight into, into applied geology and planetary science after that article came out. And I kept it, I read it dozens and dozens of times over the next few years. It was really life-changing for me. And I went into science after that, um, thinking I was sort of brainy enough to perhaps do that. And what a mistake that was, because actually, you've got to be so gifted to, to make a career in science. And what I realized I'd mistaken, actually, was a love of storytelling for a love of science. And I have a love of both. But what I really found I wanted to do was tell other people's stories. Um, like, um, like you, Martha, I got into the BBC soon after that, and um, I spent 10 years there. And it is a wonderful, wonderful apprenticeship there to learn how to tell stories, and I'm still doing it today. And do you want to give us your quick where you are right now? Well, yes, I've sort of got stuck in lunar orbit a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so I've just finished a children's book on, on all of the Apollo missions, which comes out uh, next month, called Where Once We Stood. Um, and I've written a big live show that's going to happen on the Mall here in Washington on the 19th and the 20th of July outside the Air and Space Museum and up and down the Mall. We're just cutting the film at the moment as, as I speak. And um, if any of you can get a chance to come and see that, I really urge you to. It will be, in every sense of the word, awesome. <laughs> and I don't always use that word. <laughs> so we were talking earlier, you know, the natural history world or the natural world is not the same as it was 50 years ago, 10 years ago, even last year. And obviously, as this group well knows, you know, climate change is playing a huge role. So I'm curious how specifically our changing world and climate change has affected your filmmaking and storytelling when it comes to telling stories about our natural world. Martha, you want to start? Yeah, I think, I think somebody's invitational interest might be somebody else's turn off. Um, I think so it's horses for courses. You know, some programs you want to address it fully. Some programs you want to accept it but not lay any blame. Some programs, if you want another audience, just don't mention it at all. So I think it, it's very, you know, um, in Hostile Planet, which we made recently for Nat Geo, we, it was stated very much as a fact, but we weren't pointing any fingers. That the, the cause of, of climate change was never addressed. It was just, this is what the animals are facing now. So I just think it's horses for courses. I think it's who your audience is, who you're appealing to. You've got to bring people in. You don't want to turn them off. If they're interested, engage it with it. And if they're not, then do a different kind of programming. Chris? Well, this is something we really grappled with when we were uh, thrashing out you know, what kind of beast One Strange Rock would be. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there's been a massive disconnect somehow between the storytellers and at least half the audience, those that still uh, perhaps come to these shows, that they appreciate the kind of riches of the natural world, but then they go and vote at the ballot box for the opposite. And our job is trying to bridge that gap, a chasm, if you like, actually, as it is these days. How do you do that? Is, is it something, is it a flaw in, in, in the stories and how we're constructing them? When we first started asking ourselves these questions for, for, for One Strange Rock, what we came up with together was an attempt to try and connect the lives and ecosystems of, of the animals that are featured in the series with the lives of those watching. 
in a way, a little bit like um, Pete Muller was talking about this morning, a sense of what home is and how these creatures' lives feed into our own lives absolutely and utterly directly. There's no disconnect with that. And that was why we ended up with this approach of using astronauts to connect us to it, to try and examine the world with this overview uh, perspective. But an overview perspective is a very difficult and an um, intangible thing to try and communicate. Most of us haven't flown above 60 miles or 100 kilometers above the atmosphere, and we don't really know what that feels like, however many times we're told. So our approach was to kind of connect these small, personal, often human stories. Our, our natural history sequences were often led by a human being um, with the next breath that you take, for example, in GASP, um, connecting you to the diatoms, our heroes of that episode or the nitrogen cycle um, in the, uh, the salmon bringing the Pacific nitrogen to feed the forests around the Pacific Rim, um, which maintains the entire nitrogen cycle that keeps, keeps us alive, another of our crucial life support systems. That was our approach. Now, have we achieved anything that others haven't with that? I, I don't know that's for the audience to decide. There were certainly lots of people that came and watched it and said they liked it, and people that hadn't come to this kind of subject matter before. But will that translate actually to the sorts of wonderful projects that we've been hearing about this week here? I sincerely hope so, but um, we're still waiting to find out, I think. Vanessa? I think I, mean, I agree with everything you've both said. Um, my feeling is that we need to use our best storytelling skills and our best advocates for the natural world, which is our animal characters. And I think what we're trying to do on the America series that we're um, working with uh, for National Geographic um, is to use those heroes, those animal heroes, to convey the experience that they're going through today. So instead of looking at how their experiences would have been, it's to say this is the real world for animals today. And particularly in America, the animals that succeed here are incredible at um, reacting to opportunity. And that comes from living in a uniquely dynamic continent where change is an everyday process. Every day is a brave new world. So it's, it's actually a, a great way to build the changing environment into the storytelling and see it through the eyes of the animal characters. And I feel that that, you know, we just have to get cleverer and better at bringing the reality of our changing environment into our storytelling. So let's dive into some of the shows specifically that you all worked on for us. And I think I'm gonna start with Hostile Planet. I think one of the things people don't realize is when we set out to do one of these shows, how long it takes. Hostile Planet, you shot over 1,800 hours of footage, 82 shoots, 1,300 days of filming. <laughs> You're tired just thinking about it. Um, I think some of you maybe have seen this trailer, but let's take a quick look at what was accomplished during those 1,300 days. I love that trailer. I think I have seen it maybe a hundred times. Our creative team did such a good job on that. And I think it touches on 
what I think sets this series apart, which is sort of the tone of the series. Could you talk a little bit about the tone of the series and the creative choices you made? Sure. So um, Nat Geo hadn't done a big blue chip natural history show for a while. And um, the BBC had been doing them and doing them very beautifully. And it's all very lovely. And we'll, on we go. <laughs> and Nat Geo wanted to set themselves apart and say, we want to do this differently. And the brief was to make it different, raw, hostile, that's the term we came up with, um, visceral, granular truth. And rather than, not sugar-coated, because that's a bit unfair and, and judgmental, but, or pejorative, but um, anyway, so that was, that's what we set out to do. So, so I know in the series you didn't shy away from difficult moments. I've watched it with numerous audiences, and there were moments where, what you mean. <laughs> where they would shriek um, <laughs> at watching. But you, did, you, you didn't hesitate to keep the camera just locked on what was happening. And sort of, what was the decision behind that? Well, there's a lot of debate about it, obviously. I mean, we wanted to tell the truth not only about climate change. Again, I said earlier, we didn't, we didn't point any fingers. But this is the situation. And the critical thing for the animals is the world is changing, and it's changing very fast. Animals do evolve, but they can't evolve quick enough to keep up with the climate change. So it's how are they doing? It's a sort of, it was a marker in the sand saying, how are these animals doing? And things are tougher and for them. And so the animals, some survive and thrive and do incredibly well, and others have a tougher time of it. We chose n not to pull back from the reality of how hard they're finding it and how hard they find it in a, rev in a normal year when things are lovely and wonderful and they're used to it all. But things aren't lovely and wonderful and used to it all. It is changing very fast. So we just wanted to be honest. Um, Technologically wise um, and storytelling wise, we very much wanted to be, Vanessa kind of touched on it, on the side of the animals. We wanted to be on the animal's shoulders. It's very easy in natural history and historically we used to do it where an animal would be over there and you'd have a long lens and you'd sit back and you'd watch the behavior unfold. I think audiences expect more now and we needed, the, we really wanted the audience to engage and feel that they were with the animal. So where we could, we'd have be with the animal. Um, rather than just watching it as if you were watching it through binoculars or something. And that's partly in the camera techniques we use, and it's partly in the words we use. So we, some, you know, a word not say elephants do this, but it's almost like it's... it's so let me just think of an example. Um, uh, a lion might be thinking it's a hot day. <laughs> and rather than say, well, the temperature outside is whatever it is, 40 degrees centigrade, and the lions are feeling hot, you say, it's hot. Um, you know, shade is, is really welcome. That could be in the lion's head. It's very subtle, but you're saying the same thing and you're trying to be, experience it through the animal. So we were doing, obviously, we were working very hard on the script to make you feel you're embedded with the animals, all the camera shots to make you feel that, you know, traditionally you have a POV, but we tried to really embed the POV point of view shots with the, with the watching the animal shots. So it was, it was a lot of, lot of work that went into that. And then technology-wise, so, you know, for example, we used a racing drone very effectively um, particularly in two shows, one um, being a golden eagle flying over mountains, and you know how our birds of prey stoop. So we had this racing drone literally fly unbelievably fast down these these arets, these razor edged um, edges of mountains and things. You really felt you were you were with the golden eagle. And again, in the jungles program, we had this tiny little hummingbird being battered by drops of rain that kind of went, whoa, and off, off, off balance. And then we had the racing drone. I have to tell you this very funny story. But then it's a racing drone and flying through the forest um, as if it was a hummingbird. And, he, and at one point, we were trying to endlessly wipe the lens of that racing drone. And then you saw, actually, the hummingbird is flying through this water. It wouldn't be perfect. So then we let bits of water stay on the lens, and suddenly it's a bit blurred. And the, you know what I mean? As if, and you do feel it's more visceral. But the, I just have to tell you this no, story. No, no, please. Very, no, very no, no. funny story. <laughs> so the guy who runs this, does this racing drone thing, he was doing it through, but not, you know, he can't see where his drone is going through the, the drone is going through the plants. So he's doing it all from camera on his headset. So he's, he's f literally flying with his eyes and he has a little control mechanism. He's amazingly good at it. But this little control panel has a little red light, 
And one of the hummingbirds, a hummingbird in the forest, thought, oh, that's a nice bright light. That will be a flower. I'll go and get some nectar. So this guy's blind to what's going on. And he's flying through the thing. And he's twiddling and twiddling. And this thing lands. He goes, ah, like this. <laughs> and of course, that, that, the drone then goes, whoa. And <laughs> so his drone went flying off into the trees. He had no idea where it went because he threw the control panel away. Because <laughs> <laughs> this tiny little hummingbird landed on his finger. <laughs> there must be. <laughs> Anyway. There must be so few people in the world who actually have the skill to fly a drone like that. Yeah, very few. I mean, you really have to seek these people. And, and if you want to break into a new technology, you really have to get into the scientific world and find these people who are developing think, these things, often for their scientific research, nothing to do with filmmaking. And then you try and adapt it for, for filmmaking. So one more quick question about Hostile Planet, and then we'll talk about something else. Is it, you know, there was a little streaming service that dropped a natural history program at the same time as we launched Hostile Planet. It was beautiful, but it was very traditional. It had David Attenborough. You guys went with, yeah. <laughs> you, you went with Bear Grylls, which I thought was an interesting choice as far as his narration and his voice. And can you talk a little bit about that decision and how we, how we came to that idea? Yeah, Bear, Bear Grylls, um, like him or not like him, is a survivalist par excellence, and these animals are surviving and they are resilient and they're everything that Bear stands for. Well, he stands for everything that they do day in, day out. And actually, he was kind of outside the natural history world and, and a bit of a surprise, but I think really, really fitted the show in terms of what these animals are trying to achieve. Getting Bear to narrate a natural history show <laughs> from a survival show was a really long journey. Um, and again, a fascinating one. So he kind of stood up for the first sentence, and we just warmed him up a little bit. And he said, and these bears are here. And we said, hang on a minute. You know, we just a little more gently. And, and it took a long time. But anyway, we, I just said, my initial thing was Bear just pretend you're reading to your children at night, and you want them to go to sleep. I'm trying to get him from over here to over here. And just soften the toe, deepen your voice, just relax, be really warm, and invite the audience in, invite your children into the story. So he kind of went there, and I'm still expecting him to get over here from over there. Anyway, we got there, and to do him credit, he worked really hard at it, and by the last few um, commentary records which Kevin was at, he pretty much nailed it. I mean, we had to do retakes and retakes and retakes and retakes, but we weren't over here anymore at all. He, did, he worked so hard um, to get it as far over here as he could. So he was great, yeah, good to work with. So live is obviously, another, live television is obviously another storytelling approach that we take, and Plimsoll is actually working on a show that we're airing in two weeks called Yellowstone Live. Last August, we went live from Yellowstone for four nights, and we're doing it again starting June 23rd. So we'll take a quick look at a tape, and then I'm gonna ask you a couple questions about that. It's four nights, 25 live cameras, a large number of remote cameras. How do you even begin to prepare for such a massive production? Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the live specialist. Um, I, my role really on this is kind of guarding the, the wildlife in terms of the message and, and making sure that we get that right. Um, how do you do it? Well, it literally is baby steps. You have 
I'm just basically going to walk you through this. You have a sheet of paper with five acts on it, and there are little bricks. And in those, it's one brick at a time. We want to start live, and we want to cut to amazing wildlife, and we want to see some scenery. And we and we keep on thinking we have to think about the glory of Yellowstone, and we want some live. And we, you know what I mean? And there's there's various elements that you're piecing in, and you return to. And you literally fill out that wall of bricks with, we need to come back to that here and that there, and we'll round up the wildlife here. And, and you f literally fill it in like that. And we know the animal characters, the bears, the wolves, the eagles. And you need a taste of all of them. And you want a live animal in a studio. And it's, just, it's painting by numbers, because that sounds too simplistic. But it's building a wall brick, brick by brick when you know what those, each of those bricks is. But then when there's a bear coming over the ridge in Act 2 and you didn't know, have plan for that, it, you kind of throw that out the window a little bit to some extent too, don't you? Have to be, yeah, you have to be very nimble. And the chaos, the chaos that goes on in a live truck, I don't know if you've ever been witness to a live truck, but it's this massive truck <laughs> with a studio inside and everybody's talking at once. I mean, literally probably 30 people in there all talking at once to their microphones or to each other or something. And it's comp and I, how anybody makes a program out of it. But again, that's not my role, so I'm fine about that. <laughs> but I think it's interesting, you know, because obviously NFL, football live, but it's like a football field. You're talking Yellowstone, which is like thousands okay. of miles. So that's the other side of it. This is all pre-production I was talking about. The, the real thing is the, the knowledge, the technical knowledge of bouncing, hiring. You know, I'll hire a satellite for two hours here and three hours there. And we have teams all over. And between this hour and that hour, we've hired satellite time, as you do. And you bounce all their signal. They've been filming all day. And you get all their material up and back down to the truck. And then suddenly, the editors, the moment it all starts coming in, they're quickly packaging and uh, this is what we filmed earlier and they're making these little short things. So that's all happening in the build up to the live show and then those cameras are also live in the live show. So we've had what we filmed earlier packages and you have the live cameras going satellite and down but I'm not technically logically minded so don't challenge me on this. <laughs> I, just, I just know it kind of goes up and down and out. <laughs> <laughs> I run, I run PR, that's about my knowledge too. <laughs> but sounds right. Um, let's shift for a minute to a more science-focused series, which is our series One Strange Rock, which we're incredibly proud of. Eight astronauts, six continents, 45 countries, and something I'd never seen in a science natural history series, a large portion of it from the International Space Station. Um, let's take a little look at One Strange Rock, and then Chris, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. I'm going to tell you about the most incredible place. And you know what? You're walking on it. Our planet is literally bursting with life. life, life. There's so much activity, and our planet is right in the middle of it. I really wish that everyone could see the world the way that I've had a chance to see it. The strangest place in the whole universe might just be right here. So as the trailer shows, Darren Aronofsky was involved in the show. And for those that may not know who he is, he is the director of Black Swan and Mother. I mean, those are some trippy ass movies. <laughs> <laughs> what was the sensibility and what did he bring to this series? Because he'd never done a television series before like this. 
No, no, you're right, he hadn't. I mean, I think what, what was clever about Jane Root, our CEO at Newtopia's idea, was in, in approaching him to help us with the storytelling, was it plays back to what I was saying earlier about this challenge we had of weaving stories together in a way that just made you sit up and look and think, wow, I've not seen anything like this before just in an attempt to reach out to an audience that perhaps hadn't, en ha perhaps hadn't engaged with it before. Um, so I think bringing him on board, and that happened before I was involved, was, was, was really smart because he and his writing and co-producing partner, Ari Handel, who's got a PhD in neuroscience and great science background as well, um, proved to be really instrumental in helping all the producer directors shape their stories. Um, and they've they've really wallowed themselves in some of these big ideas and these deep philosophical feelings about the cycles of life and death that keep and maintain the planet's sort of fragile biosphere. Um, and they were all themes that we wanted to include, but not obviously overtly kind of bash viewers over the head with. So we needed some way of engaging on a very human level these subjects and connecting people to them that way and letting them make their own connections and their own minds up, I suppose. Um, but by showing them, as I said before, I think, about how these deep connections between these small moments um, in, in, a, in a few hours on, on Earth transfer and translate into their own lives utterly directly. So, yeah, he was a useful partner. And right from the start, um, they were involved, the two of them, particularly Ari, in, in the script meetings with us and helping us weave our beat sheets together and re-re-rewriting them. I think I wrote 36 versions of my script before we went out shooting. That was uh, quite a lesson. I mean, it was like being at film school for a year. <laughs> um, a lot of people would pay a lot of money for that. <laughs> well, yes. Yes, the master classes were great. I learned a lot making this series, and it was one wonderful two years. You talked about this earlier, um, but maybe we just touch on it quickly, which is the, uh, using the astronauts as our storytellers, which was sort of a unique way in. Nicole Stott, uh, if you all were here yesterday, she was actually on our opening panel, who was a big part of the series. Talk about the astronauts as storytellers. Yeah, so I think actually, Vanessa, you were involved early on, before, again, before I joined, with the initial discussions with Darren about how to frame the series. I mean, you might want to say something a bit about the astronauts initially. Yes, it was, uh, I was invited out by Jane to uh, spend a week with Darren and his team, uh, which was an amazing experience. As you say, lots of film students would pay, <laughs> give their hind teeth for that. Yeah. And um, at that stage, they'd done huge amounts of research on the science, and it was incredible body of work to take that much. You know, they're very complicated ideas and distill them down. But um, Jane had said to me, I don't know what you're going to bring to this, but you might have an idea or something, um, just see what happens. And I was absolutely terrified, you know, partly in awe of Darren Aronofsky and not quite sure what I was doing in the room. Um, and I sort of stayed up all night thinking there's something wrong. It needs a kind of framing for this series. It needs a point of view. And that's when I was looking at actually through my love of David Bowie, who I've often returned to, and Chris Hadfield um, and Spiders, you know, because he sang in space. Um, I suddenly thought it has to be through the astronaut's point of view for the overview effect. And everybody um, loved it, I think, as an idea. That you immediately got it, I think, as a, as a, as a sort of format. But it's, it's one thing to have that idea and quite another thing to translate it into kind of eight really compelling astronaut personal stories that interweave with those of the planetary science. And that was a real challenge. Um, and I, I made a film with the Apollo astronauts a few years ago in the shadow of the moon and was well aware that with the right preparation and casting, you, you can find and tease out the most wonderful um, personal stories from these characters. So we spent some months casting to, to find the eight perfect hosts um, that we ended up with. And I think Eloisa Noble, producer, Eloisa and I looked at a hundred initially, a hundred astronauts we screen tested. And we distilled it slowly over the course of several months down to those eight of which Chris Hadfield was, was very, very much at the top of our list from, from, from very early on, given his communication skills. And then we worked very closely with them over those coming months to absolutely deep, deeply weave their stories in with our stories. And they had to be believable. As characters, you absolutely had to believe that they weren't just sort of telling you stuff. And the great, wonderful thing about you know, almost 60 years of human spaceflight now is that you've got a pool of 550 people who've flown into space, all with different backgrounds in science, and technology, and medicine, and the arts sometimes as well. And, and they all brought something to the science show 
by fine-tuning our selection to, to the episodes that way. They were a fascinating group. I have to say we, we did a press event where we had all eight astronauts on a stage with 200 television journalists who half the time could give a shit about anything. And they <laughs> literally all stopped and paid, they were solely focused on these eight astronauts. And they see celebrities all the time. And these, these eight astronauts stopped them in their tracks. And it was fascinating. So for season two, which I'm excited, if you don't know, we are hard at work on pre-production for season two. Our storytellers are actually going to be explorers, which we're super excited about. And we're in the process of talking to a lot of people now and figuring that out, which I think is going to be really bring a whole different perspective uh, to the series. So I want to touch on something you mentioned, which is point of view, uh, which brings us to the series that we just announced a month ago, I think, mm -hmm. called Queens. And I think we have a slide for that because we have no footage. We haven't even started shooting yet. But tell us a little bit about Queens, because I'm super, super excited about this show. I'm so excited to be doing this show, and it came about in a really interesting way. Um, for a long time, and my background's a combination of anthropology and biology, so I've been very lucky to spend time with uh, indigenous peoples around the world. Um, I was often documenting what the males were doing, and, and particularly rites of passage and all the kind of sexy stuff of guys having their heads shaved and going through dramatic rituals with bullet ants and things like that. But it was often what the women were up to that would intrigue me, and the sort of the, the power play that would be going on. And as I then transitioned into more uh, natural history filming work, the same thing was playing out. So um, I spent time in Gombe with the Gombe chimps. And again, there's lots of kind of shouting and screaming with what the males are doing. But as you dug into the depth of the studies that are going, in, are going on there with people like Bill Wallower, obviously under Jane Goodall's auspices, um, you realize the kind of complexity of the female uh, alliances and leadership and actually how think they're actually calling the shots. Um, so this was, again, happened with gelada baboons. And recently, I've been working uh, for two years in, in Africa filming elephants. And extraordinary behaviors amongst the matriarchs, not all of it cuddly. For example, we saw a rival herd coming into a waterhole. And we've been documenting um, a, the, the particular herd in front of us. And suddenly, the atmosphere changed, and it was war. And these females came in, and they were like, ears flapping. And they rushed forward and took a new calf away from our matriarch. And it, you know, just as dramatic as any kind of males in must that you might have seen, they were full on battling to get this calf back. Our matriarch went in and got her calf back. And it was incredibly dramatic. And then at another turn, you'd see extraordinary tender behaviors from our matriarch where she would, um, you know, rescue a stuck baby that wasn't even hers from certain death. So I've become more and more intrigued in, in sort of looking at what the females within animal societies are doing. In this series, we're, we're taking the kind of female-led animal societies, matriarchal societies or matrilineal societies, and we're looking at how females compete rise to power, hold on to power, and then what happens when they lose power. Why do you think this series has never been made before? It's kind of mind boggling, actually, when you think about it. Maybe I not. Think it, I think it starts with Darwin. <laughs> yeah. Genius that he is. Um, I think the, you know, the centerpiece of Darwin's theory is obviously sexual selection. And it was very much slanted towards the way males compete for females. And that, again, it's, it's quite easy to document and to see because it's dramatic, it's heads butting. Um, and I think that has skewed science and, in turn, a lot of our filmmaking. So if, to really look at what the females are doing, you need to spend a lot of time. You need to recognize individuals and follow how the relationships develop. And you know, this, this story actually developed out of a relationship that I have been developing with Janet Hand Vissering, where we've been talking about this subject matter and both of us feeling there was something there. And I had a smaller idea, which was Night Queens, which was to look at the kind of battles between lionesses and hyenas on the savannas at night. And I said to Janet, you know, I think, I think there's something here. And she went, in classic American style, we need to supersize this. <laughs> let's go big. Let's do the six-parter on queens of the animal kingdom. So the, the queen's idea isn't just going to be what we see on screen, but it's going to manifest itself largely behind the scenes as well. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, to, it's great today to be sitting here with another matriarch. <laughs> hope you're not, <laughs> hope you're not offended by that, but, um, <laughs> more, let's get our, yeah, our ears going, ears clapping. But, but actually, there aren't many female leaders in natural history filmmaking. Um, it's, I looked around in the sort of, when I was developing and learning my skills, and there weren't many women amongst us. Um, so I think it's important to try and get more voices into our industry. And it's not just about female voices. Um, we're trying to get, we're really trying to get indigenous voices from the cultures in the countries where we film, because these are the voices we need to hear. As Steve Boys was saying earlier, they are the guardians of biodiversity. So the, we very much have a bigger mission for this series so that we in, incorporate more types of people into the, the production team and work with more types of scientists and field assistants so that we increase that diversity. Well, I know the reaction when we announced that series, both internally and within the community, was just incredible excitement. So I know it, maybe we'll have you back in like two years once we have something yeah, to, show, something to and show and we can yeah. share it with everyone. <laughs> so I just want to end on one last question for you all because we're out of time. <coughs> and I said I'd try to be finished on time. I didn't promise. Um, <laughs> um, is answer for me in a, in a tweet type sentence, if you guys could make any natural history series you wanted, what would it be? And then Courtney Monroe, our president, will pick the best one backstage and fund it. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but Chris. Okay, well, I, I guess for me, being a planetary scientist, it, it would be perhaps the first documentary about the extremophiles um, in the depths of the Martian basins. So fund that. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm too competitive. I'm not going to give away my uh. secrets. <laughs> Actually, I'm a marine biologist, so I still feel there's an awful lot to be done, done um, in the oceans that we haven't. You know, I think that uh, Blue Planet and Blue Planet 2 were fantastic, but I think for a certain audience they were, and I think there's a lot more we could do in the oceans that will uh, bring a lot more people to... To, to the marine world and the importance of it. Yep. Vanessa? I'd like to develop the first game that um, takes on the environment and evolutionary theory. So Fortnite. So take the storytelling into the space where kids are mm. obsessed. Um, so that's, that's on my bucket list. Well, that's a different department. So now we can fund two things, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we... The work you guys do and the time you spend and the patience you have to deliver these amazing stories to our audiences all over the world. We're incredibly lucky to have you all working with us. And I just want to thank you all for, I couldn't find any American panelists. So thank you all for flying across the pond uh, to join us today. We really, really, really appreciate it. And again, we are so honored to be able to showcase the incredible work you guys do. So thank you so much and thank all of you.